This is the Mekong River in Southeast Asia. It spans over 2,700 miles and passes through six countries. And just below the surface of rivers like this lies one of the most important resources on Earth, sand. And we're running out of it. Sand, or aggregate, is a key ingredient in cement. Globally, it's estimated that we mine as much as 50 billion metric tons of sand every year to build our roads, skyscrapers, homes, and more. Rapid urbanization around the world has made sand a high-value commodity, so much so that for some, it's even worth killing for. But not all sand is the same, and experts say some mining operations are damaging ecosystems, infrastructure, and putting people in danger. And hardly anyone is talking about it. Every country on Earth uses sand, and it's mined in a variety of places around the world. It's the most extracted resource on Earth by volume after water, and we've relied on it as a building material since the dawn of human civilization. Sand is a highly valuable resource, and not only sand in general, but specific types of sand. So sand, chemically speaking, is very crystalline uh, quartz uh, silica sand. And there is a certain particle size uh, that is really required for use in, in cementitious products like concrete. So we'd like particles of a certain size uh, that's really great because it's really angular and it provides a lot of kind of interlocking effects at the micro scale level that really contributes to a lot of the strength of the concrete. So a lot of people will think, well, I think there's a lot of sand uh, in the world. Just look at all of the deserts around the world. And actually, it, it's the wrong type of sand. The sand particles are much, much smaller, and they're actually rounded due to weathering. So if you were to try to make concrete with the sand from the deserts, uh, it's actually quite difficult to do. You need a lot more water to get things flowing, uh, which will actually compromise the ultimate strength of, of, of the concrete. You've got mountains and other, you know, geological formations. And over the thousands and millions of years, they're being eroded by wind and rain and the elements are constantly chipping away at those, at those giant chunks of stone, breaking off little pieces, grains, right? The rains wash them down the sides of mountains into rivers, and then the rivers carry them from the mountains along across the land and out to the ocean. So all along the way, sand is sort of accumulating at every step along that process. So you have a lot of sand on the bottoms of those rivers, on the banks of those rivers. We mine that sand uh, from basically every one of those places where it occurs. Besides concrete, it's absolutely incredible how many other ways sand touches your life pretty much every single day. We use sand in paint. We use sand in toothpaste. It's used in some wines, every window, every car windshield, the screen on your phone, the silicon chips that run our computers and our phones and every other digital goo god that we use. Those are made from sand too. The elastic band in your underwear is probably made from sand. While urban expansion has driven an increase in demand for sand around the world, over the past few decades, that demand has especially skyrocketed in the global south, as many developing nations see growing populations and economies. Makweni County is one of the arid and semi-arid uh, counties in Kenya. So Makweni County uh, borders Nairobi County that, that uh, hosts the capital city. They're largely an, an agricultural community. Uh, so basically we rely a lot on uh, agriculture and livestock keeping for our livelihood. All of this is rain fed with very small pockets of uh, irrigation uh, from the small wells and water pans that collect water during the rainfall. We have only one permanent river and the rest of the rivers are actually dry river beds that are seasonal. Before the devolution, that is the decentralization of governance in Kenya in 2013, we had one central government and so natural resources were managed uh, from the central government and sand as a natural resource was largely um, unregulated. 
So we've had decades of um, unregulated and, and excessive sand harvesting, particularly from the dry riverbeds. It was very easy to transport sand from Akweni and uh, into Nairobi. The Mekong Delta is an area that is about uh, the size of the Netherlands, about 40,000 square kilometers. It uh, concentrates about 18 million people. It is a food center. It uh, has a much larger uh, contribution to the GDP per unit of, uh, of area than the rest of the country. And it produces uh, enough rice to feed half of the country. So we're talking about 45 million people on top of exporting to uh, the world and, and a wide range from the Philippines to the Middle East. Production of sand is, is on the main stem of the river across the low Mekong. So it is not only in Vietnam, it is also in Laos, in Thailand, in Cambodia and uh, in Vietnam. And probably the highest volumes are extracted in Cambodia. Despite its status as the second most extracted resource on Earth, there's actually very little regulation, monitoring, or enforcement around sand mining in many countries around the world. As a result, it's difficult for experts to quantify just how much sand we truly extract from the earth each year. And it makes assessing the scale of the environmental effects of sand mining difficult as well. So we extract from the earth, we mine the sand that we need in lots of different ways and in lots of different places. Probably the most common and the most problematic way that we mine sand is river sand mining. There's lots of really excellent high quality sand on the bottom of rivers and it's really easy to get at, right? All you've got to do is send out a big dredge, a big barge out into the middle of that river, drop a pipe down to the bottom of the river and just suck it up like a straw onto your boat. You've got a big boat load of sand, you can take it anywhere you want. And in some places, especially in the developing world, it can be literally just, you know, a few guys with shovels and a pickup truck. At the other end of the extreme, you've got multinational corporations that use huge, enormous dredging ships that can pull up sand from, from the bottom of the ocean or from the bottom of lakes, hundreds of, of meters under the water. And in between, you've got, you know, every shape and size you can imagine from, from smaller ships to land pits that are dug up using earth moving equipment. So it, it really ranges the, the whole gamut. There are cascading impacts. If the riverbed itself is dredged for sand, that can make the riverbed deeper, sometimes wider. It changes where and how water flows throughout that system and where and how sediment flows as things are removed from the bottom there's different habitat that is available or no longer available. We had decades of sand harvesting unregulated, and this led to, you know, exposing the, the dry river beds to a lot of degradation. So rivers became dead. Of course, that has an effect on uh, agriculture, so people are not able to produce as much food as they would uh, want. Naturally, large river systems like the Mekong produced a lot of sediment, about 160 million tons a year. It's because of higher power and higher demand for sand, is less sediment reaching the sea. There's mainly concession holders who have concession from the government and extract sand. The problem is that the monitoring of the extraction is limited and it's usually self-monitoring. So we believe that a large part of the over-extraction, if you want, is concession holders who under-report and over-extract. In the lower Mekong, we were probably extracting between 80 to 100 million tons a year. We most probably only have three to five million tons coming in. It's causing a deepening of the channel. We believe that it's about uh, two to three meters loss of elevation. So that's significant. You have incision of the riverbed, you have uh, erosion, you have sinking of the deltas. The extraction of sand for construction is done at the cost of significant changes in the ecosystem. With high demand and little regulation or enforcement, sand mining has become a lucrative business for criminal organizations in some countries. And many are known to work with businesses and builders to supply sand for construction projects. And they aren't above using force to get the sand they want. Paliram Chohan was a, a farmer, a vegetable farmer, in a little town about an hour south of New Delhi in India. Huge, huge, huge demand for sand in New Delhi. What happened was this bunch of goons basically came to the village one day, seized about 200 acres of the villagers' land, just took it over by force, 
ripped up all their crops, stripped out all the topsoil, and started digging up the sand to sell it to developers. Paliram Chohan was kind of a leader in his village, and you know he tried to get them, make them stop. You know he organized protests. He got his fellow villagers together, signed petitions. They went to the courts. They went to the cops, but they could not get anybody to take any action mainly because there's so much corruption in the system in India, as there is in a lot of the developing world. It's very easy for these the sand miners to just spread around a few bribes and people are kind of look the other way. But at a certain point, he was raising enough of a ruckus that it was starting to get under their skin. So at a certain point, these sand miners took him aside and said, look, you're really starting to annoy us. You're bad for business. Cut it out, shut up, or we're going to kill you. But Paliram Chohan didn't, didn't stop. In fact, he reported that threat to the police. Three days later, somebody burst into his house while he was taking a nap and shot him dead in his own bed. So that kind of violence is happening, not only in India, but also in Ghana, in Kenya, in Indonesia, in many, many parts of the world. It's local activists like Paliram Chohan, it's uh, journalists who've tried to expose this kind of stuff, have been attacked, have been murdered. It's a really, really serious issue. As the world's urban centers continue to expand, the demand for sand is expected to increase, putting further pressure on the world's rivers, floodplains, and deltas. To meet our demand for sand and mitigate the negative environmental effects of mining it, engineers and scientists are looking at developing more sustainable mining practices and alternative building materials. So my research team, in collaboration with other researchers at the University of Colorado, recently proved that we can grow a concrete-like alternative. We produced a hybrid living concrete-like building material by leveraging the biomineralization capabilities of photosynthetic microalgae. We took sand and mixed that with a little bit of a hydrogel um, and inoculated that scaffold with our biomineralizing algae. And what the algae did is that they precipitated calcium carbonate, little limestone minerals that helped cement the entire uh, scaffold structure together. And what we were able to show in our seminal publication is that not only could the bacteria that we use help in manufacturing a concrete-like alternative, we can, under certain conditions, keep the bacteria alive. And we showed that you can actually split this material into two. You can add more sand hydrogel and a little bit of the nutrients that the bacteria like. And two halves became two full bricks. And we did that two more times. Our living building material technology can result in materials that have similar compressive strengths to cementitious mortars and concretes that are used today. While our reliance on sand will remain significant, experts say that the keys to combating the negative effects of sand mining lie not just in sustainable mining practices, but in gathering more data too. To say that we're running out of sand is true, not in the sense that there will be no more grains of sand and every beach on earth will be bare rock. That's not gonna happen. There's lots of sand left in the world, but much of the sand that's easy to get at is gone, it's tapped out. And so we're having to go further and further and dig deeper and deeper and do more and more harm to get the sand that we need. There is no silver bullet solution. It's going to take a portfolio of solutions that are tackling this problem from every angle. And the future will include the production of Portland cement, and it will include the production of concrete. I think there are things that we can do now and in the short term, such as invest more in the monitoring and the understanding of the entire system around sand. And then the policy and the legislation, the requirements, the mandates to think about this issue and use sand more strategically has to catch up with the science and the evolving practices. The Global South still has to continue developing, so we have to make sure that we do not completely stifle the space to develop, but then we must do it in a way that does not harm the environment. 
if we are looking to continue to produce concrete and increase our production of concrete, we will need to look to alternative sources of fine aggregate because we know that the earth only has a, a certain amount. We all know by now, right? We're burning way too much oil. We're taking too many fish out of the oceans. We're cutting down too many trees. And now come to find out we're running out of sand, right? The most abundant thing on the planet. We consume too much. And by we, I really mean we here in the, in the rich developed world and everybody in the developing world who's fast catching up to us. We've got to find ways to live our lives and to build our cities that just consume less, not only of sand, but less of everything.